Welcome to The Contrarians, and tonight we have a panel discussion. The topic, our top three outlier albums. At least I think we did three. We might have only did two. But anyway, that's our topic. Get ready. Here we go. Contrarians, and tonight we have a panel assembled, and it's a great panel. And I want to welcome Andrew Clark here tonight because Andrew, this is his virgin episode. Welcome, Andrew Clark. Welcome to the club. Nice to have you. Um, yeah, I can only yeah, wait to throw you welcome, out of the wolves. But yeah, the discussion tonight top three outlier albums. So, what we mean by that are, are, are those records. I'm going to give everyone an example. Let's use Kiss for an example. Now, you've had all those records up until The Elder, and you knew what to expect, or Unmasked, or Dynasty, maybe. There was a period with Kiss that, well, we didn't know what they were doing. So we're looking at those bands where they had a body of work that you were used to. They all fit within a certain shell or container, and then all of a sudden... Bang, they switched it up. So that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, I want to welcome the panel tonight. We've got the Parish of Rock. We've got Rand Kelly. We've got Butch. We've got Andrew Clark. Again, welcome board. And of course, Tim Durling's here tonight. So welcome, you all. We're just going to go around. Uh, let's do this because Andrew's got to go early. But I'm just going to go the way I see it. Let's go Rand Kelly. Tim Durling, Andrew Clark, Butch, Parrish, and me, and I don't know if I have anything. I think I just said mine. Anyway, but we'll just see what we do. We can go an hour. We may go around three times. We may go down, go around two. We'll see. Rand Kelly, welcome aboard. Take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, well, this is what you'd consider low-hanging fruit, but this band maybe has put out. This band has put out really excellent prog albums and they put out excellent pop albums and they put out excellent pop and prog albums in the same album genesis but but their first album genesis <laughs> oh my yeah. god i picked it holy he crap nailed it. and on the back they give you a picture of peter gabriel <laughs> he's probably 20 years old right here actually i really like this album don't get me wrong it just sounds like the Bee Gees and the Moody Blues got together and put out an album called The Genesis. But uh, it, it, it's, it, I have no problem with it. But this is, if this isn't the outlier album, I don't know what is. Well, don't you think that some of the, well, think about it later, though. They really transitioned into that, pro, into that pop genre, but kept that progressive tinge. It was a slow transformation. But yeah, you're but, saying that first album to the second album, like Night and Day. Oh, my God. The jump from uh, from Genesis Revelation to Trespass is mm -hmm. like another universe. It's just Trespass is so beyond this. It's it's such a triumph. People, I mean, fans of the band that don't like this album consider Trespass their first album. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like that, but a lot of people do. They just ignore that thing to death and i've listened to it a whole lot and over the years and uh yeah i've never had a problem with it i think right. peter gabriel's voice is just magnificent he plays great flute and so the guitar work from anthony phillips and mike rutherford and is just great and the drummers are kind of like well there's two drummers on there there's john silver and chris stewart and they're both kind of like non noticeable i mean uh -huh. they're not doing anything very fancy but they are keeping the beat and they're doing what they were hired to do and that's it. All right. Cool. Excellent choice. Thank you, Rand. A beautiful, excellent way to start the program. Tim Durling, I'm going to throw it out to you. Are you going to mention uh, Helix by any chance? <laughs> no, I don't really think they have an outlier album, except maybe it's a business doing pleasure. Because that was supposed to be a Brian Balmer solo. There you go. But I, I've got a good one from a similar time period. All right. I, and I don't know if, if any, I've never seen anyone talk about this album except on fan forums, which aren't many. But I'm talking about an album that came out in 1995. This is oh, Night Ranger. Oh, my God. Beating oh off God. the mojo. Yes. yes. And some people are probably like, I've never even heard of this. That's the album. That's the al Right before that, 
Jack Blades left. That's the album. Yeah, Jack Blades Jack is not Blades. on this album. Jack Blades is not on this album. They they kind of disbanded in in 1989. Of course, Jack Blades did all right for himself with them. Yeah, he's doing those two albums. Then he did a couple of Shaw Blades albums, and actually, the first Shaw Blades came out in in 95 too. But Kelly Kagi, the drummer and the other vocalist, Brad Gillis, kept the band going. They hired a bass player, those picture on the back here with the hat, named Gary Moon. Now, he played in different places. I know he played on an album by Jeff Paris, a uh, guitar player, songwriter. Actually, Matt Sorum's on one of those albums, too. Um, and they put this album out very quietly on an independent label called Drive Entertainment. Never heard of it before or since. I think this is the only... If I go on Discogs, this is literally the only album listed on that label. And it's a really good, uh, it came out at a time when there wasn't a lot of traditional melodic, you know, hard rock coming out. So I bought it and I, I read it about it at Metal Edge, was surprised that there was a Night Ranger album. Uh, then I read a little bit about it. So then I went, I happened to find it. And basically it's... Um, the best way I can compare it is it's like uh, one of the albums that I thought about doing, but I did an entire Contrarians episode saying it was my favorite Motley Crue album was the 94 album with John Karabi. So I kind of compare it to that because Gary Moon doesn't sound anything like Jack Blades. Gary Moon sounds more like, I call it more like a cross between Kip Winger and when he sings at his highest, he sounds like Tom Kiefer from Cinderella. Doesn't sound a thing like Jack Blades. So when the songs that he sings are good, but they don't sound like Night Ranger, the songs that Kelly sings sound like Night Ranger. But it's a good album, and the band themselves don't even count it because uh, the next year after this happened, the original band got back together and put out an album called Neverland. And then the next year after that, they put out an album called Seven. Well, actually, it's their eighth, but they don't count this. Hey, they can't, they can't count. <laughs> so they can't they, they call the third album seven wishes too but anyway um but yeah feeding off the mojo night ranger good album sounds like them when kelly sings doesn't sound like them when gary moon sings but a good album but totally sitting outside of the rest of their catalog excellent holy crap check that out hey, i think i've got it well, excuse me sorry rand what Sorry to interrupt, but I got well. I'm thinking about it because I could lose my thought train anytime. Uh, I saw Night Ranger in 1983 in Eureka, California, and Jack Blades made a comment while they were playing. He says, "We're not doing any slow songs because slow songs suck." <laughs> Next album has Sister Christian. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's because yeah. the record company was talking to him. <laughs> yeah, I catch you guys. I, listen, I I don't know where that bravado comes from because I think I think their ballads are amazing and I think their, oh, yeah. their rockers are amazing. I. But yeah, I mean, it's funny when bands make statements like that, and then they turn around and go into a slow song. But anyway, so much for consistency. Yeah. Oh, Tim, are you a big Night Ranger fan? Huge. Got to, oh, I finally got to see I didn't them know that. this year. I learned finally. something about yeah. Tim every day. We have a show, and I didn't know he was a big Night Ranger fan. All right, cool. I've talked about them so much on my show. I got to see them finally earlier. Well, it doesn't mean I watch your show for God's sake. No, I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm just giving you a hard time. But yeah, I finally got to see them, uh, did a little meet and greet, just met them very, very briefly. Uh, they opened for Brett Michaels. I wish they had a headline, but I mm -hmm. got to see them because they never play around my area. I had to drive uh, like six hours to go for New Hampshire. Oh. But, yeah. All right, I'm just giving you crap, Tim. All right. I, ex I like but the no. I like the I, I know. <laughs> there's there's going to be a darkness show on the horizon. Andrew Clark, <laughs> welcome to the Hazing. Nice like, to see you here. Nice to see you. Um, all right welcome aboard so what 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 can you contribute to this discussion Ms. mr right. clark well one of my favorite bands has been putting albums out since the early 80s i always considered them a hard rock or metal band okay. but apparently they've now been reclassified as hair metal and get played like hair nation i never considered them that okay so they went through their 80s period and then, like so many other bands of that genre, got lost in the 90s. And in 1997, they put out Here in the Middle oh. Queen's Reich. You showed me that, and I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. in black and white. That's Yeah, what, it's what black and white. That? What's the deal? Well, this is, this is a copy that my buddy gave me. Uh, it uh, made <laughs> I couldn't find my original copy. I've got it around here. I think I'm both. Damn. Here, I thought it See, was like some kind of promo yeah, or something. It's, 
Yeah, that's yeah. a great album, but it is kind of different sounding. What's yeah, the title? Yeah, I missed it. What's, very the much a, what's the title uh, again, Andrew? Here, H E A R, in the now frontier. Okay. Yeah. So, so many bands were trying to be to be, jump on the grunge bandwagon mm-hmm. and get some of those grunge dollars. And Queensryche is the last album with all the original guys from the first. Well, the first the first EP. Mm-hmm. And I love this record. I have been listening to this. I remember I was telling my buddy I have downloaded samples, thirty second samples before the album came out in 1997. So it took like three hours to download thirty seconds of a song. <laughs> and I all, remember listening all the good old days. Yes, yes, yeah. Dial up. And- I was at, I was actually at my brother in law's house in the middle of the night because I always work night shift, and I was downloading these thirty second clips. I was so excited because I had not been a fan of Promised Land, the album before that. I had up until then, so when this album came out, I was so excited. They, it was so good. I thought, oh, this is going to be huge, and it went um, Billboard Top two hundred. It went to number four. That's pretty good. Yeah, I don't think it stayed there anytime because I don't think anybody bought it. I don't think it's been certified. No, it hasn't, which is a shame. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, everything up until then, at least from the third album on, it had mm-hmm. definitely been certified. Uh, Promised Land, I think, went gold. And then and then this album came out, blip on the radar, gone. Nobody remembers it anymore, but I always thought it was a great album. I gave up after Promised Land. I love Promised Land. I hate yeah, it. Pro- I still, I still keep going back to Promised Land and hate it. I don't know. Why. I like some of it. It's a I prog like album. It, but, All right, uh, it's the prog album. I like album. the album better. I think yeah. it's their progiest album. It's not very metal. It's more prog. It's the last one I loved before uh, Todd Latour joined the band. All right. All right. There yeah. you go. All right, that was Andrew. 94. What was it? 1994. 94. Well, dig this, Andrew. 1986, I saw Queensryche open for Ozzy at the Newport in nice. Columbus, Ohio. The Newport's essentially an Agora. It's, it used to be the Agora. So you're talking about a venue that's not that big. 86, they open for Ozzy. Jakey e. Lee's playing guitar for Ozzy. It's the original Queensryche lineup. And we, I was literally up in the front row right in front of Jeff Tate. Nice, and they were, yeah. they were wonderful. I'll give you yeah. that. Wonderful. I'm go- I'm Ozzy was good too. I'll give him that because it was Ozzy was still functioning. Yeah, um, <laughs> but that was a great show. Yeah, Queen's I'm right. actually going to see Jeff Tate tomorrow do a solo show in Everett, Washington. Cool. Oh, Very nice. Cool. Good for you. Oh. So excellent, okay. excellent choice. This is going just smash. Thank you. All right, let's throw it over to Butch. <laughs> Butch, nice to see you. What's your uh, good to see you? Throw us out something. Well, I mean, I'm not sure which one I wanted to go with first, but let's start with, I'll start with this one since they came up earlier. Um, not everyone's favorite Kiss album, and uh, but it's not going to be The Elder. Oh, well, um, but that's this is my like favorite. The other, I feel like uh, it's The Elder, oh, 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 a big yes. outlier in their uh, catalog. I mean, nothing in the catalog sounds like this. There's bits and pieces, maybe, that on Revenge or some well, that's, of those records. Isn't that the grunge record? Well, I mean, I don't call it a grunge record, but uh, yeah, yeah, most people do. I mean, it definitely is of its time. Uh, you know, they'd come out with after, you know, I don't want, I'm not going to, I don't want to throw there. I'm a Kiss apologist, so I don't really want to throw any records under the bus. But let's just say after getting uh, off track a little bit with not, albums from 1987 through 1989, they finally righted the ship in my eyes with Revenge. And then, uh, you know, before the whole reunion thing was a thing, they were working on this record for a number of years. And I think, obviously, trying to fit in with what was going on because Revenge didn't do the numbers that they hoped it would. I mean, I think it, between that album, the tour for Hot in the Shade, at least, I think it kind of put them, like, got them a little bit of respect back that maybe they'd started to lose. Um so I think they were trying to do another, you know, obviously they're trying to do something darker and heavier. And I mean, it, like this whole album is, is dark and uh, 
and heavy. I mean, some of the heaviest stuff they've ever done is on here. Hate, you know, um, one of the rare times I start with a Gene song on the record, you know, kind of like Revenge did with Unholy. Um, and a lot of this stuff, yeah. I mean, it's like Soundgarden-esque, Alice in Chains, like the heavier end of what was going on with grunge. Um, there's a lot of groovy, like Master and Slave has some groovy kind of stuff in it. Um, you know, even I Will Be There, while not not being grungy, obviously, it has more of a, I don't know, it's got more of a, maybe more of a throwback kind of vibe for, you know, it's more acoustic based and uh, I don't know, it's a little bit more ethereal or something than like ballads they've had, they'd had recently, like every time I look at you or forever. I mean, it's a different kind of, kind of song. Um, I don't know. I like uh, this album, like when I, I had it on who didn't, uh, if you were a Kiss fan, you, we had bootlegs of this for a long time, you know, like this, right. first of all, this album cover sucks. Um, I mean, <laughs> not, not for any reason other than uh, the original artwork they were going to use is I thought fit the music way better, but I guess they didn't want to, you know, they, they wanted to capitalize on by having product out after the reading started. They just wanted to get this out. Um, but I guess they didn't want to confuse people into thinking, oh, this is like a new actual album. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't stand the artwork. Uh, but the me, I really, I, I really liked it. I mean, I like the. I used to listen to the, 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 the crappy sounding bootlegs I had of it. Um, I love Jungle. I think is one of the best songs they, they ever did. Like a great single, did well at rock radio. I mean, it has one of the catchiest choruses. Like definitely one of Paul Stanley's best, best songs overall. Um, I don't know. Like uh, I love the the the, uh, the vocals on it. Never goes away. Or Paul sounds amazing on on that it's like you know he's got like his you know not to not to stress the uh the grunge connections too much but it's really got like kind of like a you know chris cornell-esque mm -hmm. kind of vibe going to it um they really like put his he really puts his voice out there i mean paul was at his peak from vocally from like 89 up throughout the 90s like i think up until like the early 2000s like he's amazing um the gene songs on here are great um you know, I walk alone is okay. Like I don't really care for Bruce's voice. I thought it was cool they let him sing on a record. It's kind of like I don't know, like a token um, vocal kind of kind of thing. But I mean, it's good. I I don't. There's definitely grunge elements to it. It's definitely darker. I mean, it, this is definitely not, you know, the Kiss of Old. This is not your their part rock and roll all night party every day kind of record. This isn't lick it up. Um, it's well, not even. Well i'm just saying everything after dynasty i'm just gonna say it's all a bit of a departure every record's a little bit different you know yeah it, they are but i mean it, we're talking like you're talking like minuscule mm -hmm. variations once they got to creatures mm -hmm. of the night i mean it was heavy and then lick it up was kind of like creatures part two mm -hmm. also great just not as big sounding animalize had its thing asylum those records are kind of like i would see them as like a pair and then crazy nights they were trying to like do the def leopard bon jovi thing and that was not good for me um and uh you know i think uh they try to get a little bit more back to their roots with hot in the shade but it was still like rough i mean i loved all these records at the time they came out i would have defended them to their death it's just in retrospect now when i go back yeah the collection something's got to be at the bottom well the problem um, but... is that kiss used to be leaders and when this record came out this is a whole other show we're on a tangent if anybody under knows me we'll go on tangents kiss became followers so this is truly uh, where they were following instead of leading like they used to, you know, you know, well, I, mean? I think most, of, I think most of the bands at that time were, I mean, it's just, yeah. You know, there, you, there were worse. You, well, a lot of the legacy bands, sure. They didn't know what to do, you know? I mean, what do, what do you do? I mean, you're used to a certain lifestyle. I mean, it's, you want to keep going. You don't want to, you like who, who, I mean, I work in a cube or I don't work in a cube anymore, but I work in like a, my library, you know, I work for a university. I mean, I would if I could play music. I mean, who the hell wouldn't want to play music for their career instead of doing a nine to five job? So exactly, I don't blame yeah. I don't blame these bands. I think they stayed as close to what they were as they could. Um, for me, like I love this record. I love Subhuman Race by Skid Row. I thought those were like I like that down, record, like, knockout records. Like love those. And then on the other side, I didn't like the Motley Crue record. I hated um, one of the, the the. I always get the. I'm probably so traumatized by the record that. The the docket album that followed dysfunctional. Shadow life, shadow that, life. Oh, terrible. Thank you, Thank Tim you. Durling. Thank you, Tim oh, Durling. Dysfunctional was pretty good. 
I yeah. like this horse. Shaft is a piece of garbage. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. I don't need to get off track. Off but, whole, uh, a hole in my collection. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh my god, it's so bad. But, but so anyway, yeah. I mean, Carnival Souls. I love it. I think it's definitely like other than the Elder, it's the most different thing. Like in their catalog, kind of. There's nothing they ever did that before or since that really has this vibe revenge is probably would you say revenge is probably the closest butch i mean it's if it's you went close. right There's from this... if you went right from hot in the shade to carnival of souls that would be quite a you know quite a jolt revenge is kind of the buffer it's not as down tuned it's not as strict production wise but it's getting there yeah and like revenge still has the i think the other thing about revenge too is it's on the it's still on the you know they're still talking about you know, waving your panties in the air. Yeah, and, lyrically. Uh, yeah, lyrically, lyrically, it's still old yeah. kiss. This is like yeah. the dark. You know, yeah. how often do they write like dark kind of stuff? Not really. I mean, God of Thunder, like kind of, but it not. I mean, it's kind of like just like a silly Gene Simmons kind of like. You know, it's his character that you know that they gave the song to him. I mean, it's the, like it's, a fantasy. It's like a fantasy lyric. Yeah, it's, I mean, this, this is this like I'm trying before, to get. Or, well, God yeah. of Thunder, you know. And, the, yeah. Nod, nod, wink, wink. We're, st we're still throwing panties in the air, but it's dark and evil, but yeah. with panties. Um, <laughs> and there was concern. I mean, there was concern that, that Carnival Souls wasn't going to come out at all. So I'm glad it did. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad at it, least we got, yeah. sorry, clean up. You know, it sounds good. I'm glad it came yeah. out. I was excited when it came out. I'm pissed about the cover, but what are you going to do? I mean, the, the music's there. They're my favorite band. It's nice to have it in my collection. So whatever. And that's good enough for me. Thank you, Butch. Excellent. That's a good choice. Because <laughs> a lot of those Kiss records, like I said, you could pick a lot of those different ones. They were kind of lost trying to I find was themselves. I between this and The Elder, but I figured someone else would. So I said, I'll the elder, The Elder is an obvious go-to. Someone may pick it. I don't know. We'll see. Thank you, Butch, though. That was awesome. Oh, my God. The, the Parish of Rocks here. And he's got a Cheap Trick shirt on. That's a uh -huh. great shirt, man. And he's got found all the parts on the wall. So I'm cool. ready to hear what you're going to say. Cheap trick. Wow. Nice. All, it all, you know, Parrish, it all comes back to cheap trick. Always comes back to cheap trick. Now, I wouldn't normally pick a first album as an outlier, because quite often the first album a band is still finding its finding its feet. But but my journey was cheap trick um was a bit different. So it's not the first album as far as I'm concerned, it's the fourth album. And the reason for that is I, I got into cheap trick, I saw them on the telly. Um, in 78 or 79, they, there was a program called Rock Goes to College that was on the telly, and they had a series of really good bands, ACDC, um, Roy Gallagher, The Stranglers, and Cheap Trick. And it was about the time that um, At Budokan came out. I can't remember if it was just before or just after. So, And, and if you haven't seen it, it's YouTube. It's definitely worth watching. Um, it shows you how brilliant a band they were back, back at that time. Um, so I went out, as you do, you go out and buy an album. I bought the Budokan album because that was the one that was being sort of pushed by the program. And then I went back to explore the, the previous catalogue. And in the UK, the previous catalogue was In Colour and Heaven Tonight. This album wasn't released in the UK. So oh, it wasn't? It, didn't, it wasn't. It didn't actually come out until after um, Dream Police. In wow. fact, I think I got found all the parts ep before i actually got that first album it wasn't even available anywhere over here on um on import and in fact i don't know where i got it because it's got stamped on the back property of cps a cbs demonstration only not for sale so i don't actually know where i got this from um but somehow I'm, i got it at, i got it from somewhere at the time um and the first time i heard any song from that album was the B side to this as a single, which is also what the T shirt is. Tremendous. So What's the B side to I'll I'll be with you tonight from Dream okay. Police, and on the back is He's a Whore. So that was the first time I'd heard anything off the debut album. So for me, this comes forth from the studio album. So I've heard In Color, I've heard Heaven Tonight, pop rock albums in effect. I've heard Dream Police, which is maybe a bit heavier but still very poppy. And then I finally get hold of this album. And to me, it sounds very different. It, it sounds much rawer. It hasn't got so much pop. It, it sounds almost like a punk album to me, with, with Robin Zander's vocals a lot more gruff and, and a lot more sort of uh, aggressive, really. And then you've got the actual 
sort of the, the the lyrics themselves are pretty extreme as well. You've got you've got lyrics about paedophilia. You've got lyrics about um, suicide. You've got lyrics about um, mass murder. So so the whole tone of the album, I think, is very different. And and I don't think they've ever done anything like it since e- either. So. So not only does it not flow into the In Colour and, and Heaven Tonight pop, pop rock albums, I don't think they've really ever returned. Yes, there's the odd song I think is similar, but as a whole album, to me, that is very different to anything that they've done since. So yeah, that's, that's clo- my first album. I think the closest they ever really got to that vibe again was that the 97 record, yeah. um, also self-titled. It kind of has more of a stripped-down kind of vibe they did a yeah i think plus, yeah plus it's the def- single it's de- with fig and it's definitely rawer but i still don't think it has quite the same aggression no or that darkness or that darkness that that sat with that first album agreed yeah i just think it's like the closest they ever yeah. they probably ever got again to yeah to, you know it was a good reset for them that record yeah, yeah and i think definitely. jack Go douglas ahead. i mean a lot of these songs have been around all the Heaven Tonight songs, all the In Color songs. Rick Nielsen had all these backlogged. Be- for God's sakes, they recorded um, Lookout for the first album and didn't make it. What as, a great song. <laughs> as That's my favorite Cheap Trick song. As brilliant as that song is, you know, it didn't make the first album because it's a little bit more. Yeah, the first album is very kind of dark to some degree. Yeah, what they picked for that, you know, all kind of blend together. What they and, and particular, color, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but they well, did record I, 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 some stuff that didn't make the first album. You know, well, and I think I think maybe, maybe it was intended. I don't know, but when you think that they had all of those songs to pick all of those as your first album, mm-hmm. wasn't wasn't a very commercial view. You wouldn't think that they wouldn't they yeah. would have started out with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that. Anyway, that's my that's my first pick. See, I, I think that's a great pick. I never would have thought about it, but the way you're coming in on this record, you know, after Dream Police and they go and do this record, you're sitting there going, what the hell's going on here? I could get that. Yeah. Makes yeah, it's a good take. I, I thought about them, but uh, I, you know, when I thought about them in terms of outliers and it, what, what ones I actually liked, like I was like, I wasn't going to talk about the doctor or lap of luxury. Like I didn't think about the first one in that way, but it makes a lot of sense. If you look at it in chronological order, it all makes sense. But the way the par- the Parish of Rock is coming in at it, yeah, I could see where it would really yeah. be an outlier. So there For you go. Sure. That's, a good sh- that's a good choice. So you didn't want to talk about the doctor, though, right, Parish? Of course, yes. <laughs> not, not my favorite cheat trick album. <laughs> no, not good. Not good. All right. What are we at? Oh, th- 837. All right. I'm just going to go. Rand Kelly. You got another one for us? Oh God, he's pressing. You're not his doing one. I uh, I don't know. I kind of already did it in the beginning. Oh, good. So go ahead, know. but it's not about me on this show. It's about well, then you won't you, you won't mind what I'm going to do next then. <laughs> oh God, is it a yes album? Wait, whoa, whoa. Well, you can just <laughs> smile. It's the most outlier Beach Boys album that exists. I mean, they put it on the shelf for how many years? It was ready to go and yeah, but I think I don't. And it didn't come out until 2011. Yeah, but I don't. I don't agree with that because Smiley Smile was way out there, and yes. it came after Pet Sounds. If you look at Pet Sounds and look at Smiley Smile, I could have grabbed Smiley Smile, but I just saw this and I thought, well, that's pretty out there. It's way out but, there. But maybe you're right. It could have been Smiley Smile. Well, but it should have a- been because that was really re- that was a a. Uh, for real release in 67 yeah smile didn't come out until what 2014 or something 2011 2011 whatever you know well brian released it in 2004 but well it's a live record in a studio i bought both yeah. but you know what i just i just think this is the weirdest <clears throat> beach boys album ever and it's also my favorite i i love it it's mm-hmm. so good and uh i'm gonna stick with it you can disagree if you like <laughs> But I mean, just like, you know, can I, I don't remember. Well, if you're going to talk oh. Beach Boys, get ready, Rand, because I can talk well, Beach yeah, Boys all day. <laughs> I know, but this thing's got so much going for it. I just got the, I got the cheap box. It took, and it I've, got the, me. I've got the big one. Yeah, I, I figured. <laughs> and I've got, <laughs> exactly. And I've got the Sea of Trees. And I've got the Sea of Trees. all those songs. 
and I've got the uh, Sea of Tunes box at the bootleg with four yeah, CDs sure in you it. Do. I do. But uh, yeah. anyways, uh, I just find it the most in- engaging, attractive Beach Boys album. I love Pet Sounds, but for me, this trumps Pet Sounds so much. I love it. All right. That's fair enough. It's a valid point. And uh, uh, Good Vibrations and uh, Surf's Up are worth the price of admission alone. I think Surf's Up is their best song ever. It's just an amazing tune. Try to sing it sometime. <laughs> well, that's pretty much just Brian so They go to that, that Colin Native Ruins Domino. That, that's, that's a, well, that's, that's not... High, call, yeah. Carl goes to a high F on that, and I... I, I saw Brian do it too on TV, but I can't do that. I can't jump that high uh, uh, up unless I'm screaming and everybody has to leave the uh, house. I mean, yeah, but Brian can't do it either because his voice has been shot since. Well, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm talking about when he did that special on Leonard Bernstein. Get Jim oh. Gillette to do it. Jim Gillette and, could hit that note. <laughs> yeah, that the Leonard well, Bernstein Glenn thing Hughes was. Could do it. I mean, Glenn well, Hughes could do it in his sleep, but I'm just saying. It, it's such a unique song, and the lyrics are. I think Van Dyke Parks just knocked it out of the park. Uh, yeah. Excuse the pun there, but yeah, I I have no. I can see why Mike Love didn't like it because it's just no. not. It's not up his. It's not up his alley. It's not his right. wheelhouse. Right. All right. I, I accept care. that. I don't. I care accept what it. Love thing. <laughs> I accept it. I don't. Care uh, let love. me look at the time. So, Andrew, you, you're leaving here in ten minutes. Half an hour. Well, half an hour, you'll be fine then. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rand. That was beautiful. Tim Durling, give us something else. We'll probably just go around twice. Well, this is a band that's been mentioned, which which makes me happy because it's an interesting uh, career to talk about. But this is a case of, is it a band or is it just a name? Queensryche. <laughs> Queensryche. Nice. Frequency Good unknown. All Good known question. is F you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the only... It's the only time I can think of where where two albums came out in the same year under the same band name. And spoiler alert, I like them both. I I thought, great, we're getting, you know, we're getting twice the amount of music. It's good. I think that Queensryche hit their absolute nadir with Dedicated to Chaos. The very first time that I was on The Contrarians with Marco, I tore that album a new one. I hate it. (laughs) <laughs> that that Rock and Shadow Life and Bon Jovi Burning Bridges, they're only on my show. I thought about turfing them many times, mm-hmm. but I'm too I'm too much of a completist. But it's just awful. So um, you know, the circumstances were so strange. I mean, you know, Jeff Tate splitting from the rest of the band. You know, it was a race to see who could get an album up first. And this isn't this is not this isn't a band. This is Jeff Tate with various rotating cast members i mean i talked about night range before brad gills plays on this dave menichetti plays on this kk downing plays on this uh, rudy sarzo's on it um help me out here there's there's tons of guests on here uh but th- despite everything i think that jeff managed to put together a pretty decent album it's just i don't know whether it's a queen's rank album or not but it's definitely an outlier because you know if it had come out a year later, he couldn't have put Queensryche on it. It was, you know, he, he right. lost the rights to use the name. But despite all of that, and there was so much controversy at the time, he was really doing this negative press campaign. I don't know if you guys remember, but he was he was critiquing people that were bad mouthing the album. Like it was just it wasn't a good look for him at that time. But mm-hmm. so you think you'd think that it would just be a recipe for like, well, this has got to suck. It actually doesn't suck. It's actually a decent collection of songs. I just don't know how Queensryche it is, but. I thought that makes it perfect for this. So you know, your you description there, Tim. In fact, I've never heard, heard Tim, other than tonight, talk about two records that said they actually sucked. The first time I've been on shows with Tim, many times, and he's never I don't, said I that. Don't like, I don't like to dwell on the negative. I, usually, you know, I know, I, you're very positive. People have, asked, people have asked me, so, you know, why haven't you done a show on such and such? Look, I'm not a fan. And there's no point in me talking about a band that I don't like because I'm talking out of my rear end because I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not a fan. I get so, you. Um, but you mentioned that Queensryche album. You know what popped into my head? Guns N' Roses, Chinese Democracy. It's oh, it's yeah. it's very similar. The way you describe yeah. it. I it's mean, who's singer, on that right? record? Who, yeah, it's, yeah, it's singer, Axel right? doing his in, thing. In even yeah. though a lot of people like Chinese democracy that we did. Love a- it. Love <laughs> that. Album. I know. I know. We did it. We did a show. We talked on, about it. 
on the contrarians. We did. I'm not bad mouthing that album at all. But you know, but it really is an Axl Rose solo album. I'm just saying. In a lot of cases, an outlier album, and, and the Night Ranger one was a good example too. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, what Martin would call a compromised lineup. Because <laughs> that you're not came likely, up today. Yeah. You're not likely to have a band that's the same guys and for one album do something completely different. There's got to be some ingredients that are also in the mix, whether it's musical trends. But usually there's there's other people involved that weren't involved earlier. You wouldn't have gotten an album like Frequency Unknown with Chris DeGarmo. You know, like right. It, it seemed like it seemed like when DeGarmo left, I'm going off in a Queen's Rake grant. Well, that's okay. The that's album's right. just started, just you know, yeah, that's okay. That's it. But like I can't stand dedicated to chaos. I like three or four songs on it that I think are just okay. If anybody's interested, okay. I, like I said, like it is the very my very first appearance on here. So we're talking about that album. I just hate it so much. That one or I don't know if that one or Aerosmith just push play. I don't know which one I hate worse. But um <laughs> Wow. But wow. I think that okay. Jeff, on his own and Queens Rake the band, they had to reach that rock bottom because I think they both came out of that making pretty good music, just not together. I love all the Todd Tory albums. I think they're fantastic. All four of those, I think, are just great. Um, I like the three Operation Mindcrime albums. I think the first one was the better one. But, um, yeah, it's almost like they had to completely crash and burn and to to keep going. I get it. Yeah, but I, this I, one, I totally understand. Yeah. This one came up three months before the Todd Tory album, the self-titled one. They're mm-hmm. very, very different. But I, I, I listened to both of them I, so much so that I actually burned myself a CD for my car where I went back and forth between this album and the self-titled album, Song for Song. And mm-hmm. it was kind of like musical whiplash. But the funny thing is, if you start putting, and I'm not going to get it, but putting the song titles together, they kind of link up, which is kind of mm-hmm. funny. There's like a world without, life without you. Like there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's some weird synchronicity with the song titles. But anyway, a, a good record, but definitely an outlier. Tim, can, can I ask you a technical question real quick about LPs? Yeah. Do you leave the cellophane on like that all the time? I am the weirdest uh, vinyl collector, Rand. I don't open my vinyl because I don't have a decent record player. That hasn't even been opened yet? No, I buy them. I buy oh, them oh I see. This is a show that collects vinyl and opens up their album and leaves the cellophane on. I can they answer that. Work. They will oh, work. not necessarily. It's a matter of time. I've had it happen. Yeah, but if you're putting, oh, this is a, we're on a tangent again, kids. <laughs> yeah. I leave the cellophane on, and they've been fine. It's yeah. all how you store. Maybe it depends I've on bought your environment. Like that, that still had the old cellophane. I like it when you find them with the cellophane on, and they've still got the old price price tag. Yeah. Sometimes a hype sticker. I still have an original pressing of Who Sellout still sealed. I always said Deca. that the reason they call it shrink wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't leave it in the sun, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I, go, our, summers, our summers get here in Reading about 115, so... It, yeah, it's but different... they're only going to warp in the sun, not in heat. Yeah, that's true. That's the only way they're going to warp. But we My are room. having a show on the contrarian, so stay tuned, kids, about taking care of your vinyl. So stay tuned. That's don't warp in the sun without, without cellophane. So. It's true. We are going to have a show on the contrarians about that, so... Oh, wow. It's all about plugging things. All right, let's keep going. Andrew Clark. Okay. The... All right. What so you got? My... What's your number two? Well, my number two was going to be Guns N' Roses, Chinese Democracy. <laughs> well, it still can be. You can elaborate on it. Okay, I, go I to your number three up... then. That's fine. I actually came up with about six outlier albums, and I could discuss any one of them. But the next one on my list is Warrant. Yeah. Dog eat dog. Oh, I was I, I was going to guess belly to belly, but oh uh, well, I'm interested, I'm interested to hear. Never heard belly to belly. <laughs> All right, and I'm interested. I'm intrigued by this. So go ahead, Doggy go ahead. Great. What about it? I think I think this is a fantastic record. Machine Gun. I remember the first time I heard Machine Gun. Mm-hmm. Just like <sighs> hair blown back, I was like, "Oh my god, this is great!" Because mm-hmm. when Warren came out, their first one, I bought their first album. I thought. Eh, it's cute. The yeah. second album came out, outside of Cherry Pie, I thought the rest of that was fantastic. Are you great telling me you weren't a fan record. of Cherry Pie? The song Cherry Pie, the first day was okay. okay. And then a million times later, when I heard it the next day, it got a little old. <laughs> I got it. 
Yeah. But if you exclude Cherry Pie, you dig the record. You like that uh, record. Okay. Love, love that record. Okay. Uh, song and Dance Man, I think it's one of the Rainmaker. Great. That's yes. a great song. Oh, so good. Yeah, I think J.D. Lane is just a brilliant songwriter, and I thought he got better as he went along. All right. So this I, one. I was a fan of Bobby Brown. <laughs> I knew. Yeah. You know, Rand's yeah. just like a, he's just like a walking gland. I knew he's going to go there. <laughs> walking gland. Rand the walking gland. Rand, you, walking gland. you know, Rand, I love you, but you always have to take it to that next level, for God's sakes. That was awesome. Anyway, okay. Andrew, so, anyway, so this record came out after what? Because I don't know enough about Warrant, so I'm really interested. It, it is their third record. It came out after Cherry Pie. It was the one that followed Cherry Pie. But this record did not sell for anything, did it? No. It went no. gold. It, that's did it, it go though. Gold? Managed to go gold. Wow. All right, well, so Cherry Pie came out, remind me, what year what was that? 86? 90. See, that's The first late. album was 89, second one was 90, and then and then Doggy Dog came out like late, or like August 92. Well, that's okay. why it, it that's why it failed. We're in the grunge era. I'm surprised. Right. You know what? It the wouldn't fact fit. That certified is, is, is admirable. In that era, and but they were like Warren, Warren got everything screwed. Was wrong, right? Yeah, but they got screwed. Had they appeared two years before their debut, they would have had a chance. Just like Skid Row, Skid Row came in right at that tail end and got screwed. You know, now, Warren yeah. heavied up. Warren heavied up. Doggy Dog, similar to Skid Row heavying up on Slate to the Grind, and both of those albums were produced by Michael Wagner. Sorry, Andrew. It's your oh, choice. nice. I just, yeah. I love no, you album. know what? It's all good. Then it's all about. Go. All we're doing is having a discussion, so it's all good. So anyway, go yeah, ahead, Andrew. You're good. Exactly. So uh, April 2031, I think, is a fantastic ballad-ish type thing. Andrew War Warhol was great. The Bitter Pill, Hollywood, so far, so good. So what? Just packed with great, great songs. And I always thought it was so funny because uh, Jane Lang talks about going in to meet the president of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And the first time he walks in there, the shot for Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking Rich is up on the wall. I know that story. It's a great story. And, yeah, and then the second the second time he goes in there, Warren, just, uh, Cherry Pie is over top of his desk, and he walks in there ready to promote the heck out of Doggy Dog, and Allison James is over top of the And he knew. He, yeah, knew! he knew it was writing up. on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. The Cherry Pie guy. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah that's what he became known as but yeah. great songwriter he was a great great band i still have never seen them i would love to see them i know it's not jamie anymore sadly he's gone but but i i would love to see them still mm -hmm. and one other funny thing about this record it is warrant dog eat dog mm -hmm. and there's a band out there called dog eat dog right. that put an album out called warrant Warrant, yeah <laughs> how ironic <laughs> Oh, they they did it on purpose. That's funny, though. You have to admit. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic. But warrant, that's a good choice. I wouldn't think we hear any warrant today, but hell, yes, we did. Yeah. Excellent. I yeah. love Inside Out from that record. The oh, way yeah. that song smokes. Yeah. Get this mic so good. <laughs> yeah, get this mic out of my fucking face. But you know, I, I'm just gonna say I'm not a warrant guy. I could become. Maybe I need to check it out. But you may. I know the first two Ooh. records, but that third record. You'd yeah. be hard. You'd it's, be it, hard. It almost, it almost sounds like a different band. Yeah, yeah. but the thing Very is, if you're, let's say you're out in the wild, you're like going through the CD bins, yeah. used bins. You never see that third record. If uh, you it's do, like it's three or four bucks. Pick it up. Get it? Yeah. 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 I've yeah. never seen it. Right. Yeah. Andrew's holding it up. I'm going. What the hell is is that? <laughs> <laughs> never seen it before. Well, they were just out of favor at that time. Not Very not much. Big deal. Yep. but this is what this show's about learning a lot about these bands we might learn something and we want to pick something up all right butch let's throw it over to you all right well i was debating between the two of these uh i'll go with this one I, I, man I, I guess maybe it's not a total outlier but i think it kind of is it kind of fits the definition and that's this record uh right here um yeah i mean yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. There's definitely, obviously, there's deep purpleisms on this record. You still got John Lord and Ian Pace, but it's really a different creature than, you know, when Blackmore left, gone were almost any trace of any of the clock kind of stuff that was weaved in to their music. And this is like a, 
uh, even though they've been leaning towards this a little bit as they when when Glenn joined the band and David joined with Burn and then especially on Stormbringer, there was some funky stuff. But like, this record is like, you know, the most full but still heavy version of the band. And the catalog sounds like this, and that's obviously because Blackmore's not on it. Um, you know, Steve Morse later, but the the records with Moore still sound more like traditional Deep Purple than this record does. And I, I this is just, you know, Bolin had a such a unique way of playing, um, and his stamp is all, him and Glenn are all over this record. I mean, David too, of course, but uh, I mean, I just, record. I, I first heard getting tighter on uh, when I bought the, there's a Tommy Bolin box set that came out years and years ago called The Ultimate, and uh, I picked that up, and uh, I heard getting tighter with, holy shit, like that was killer and so i went and back in the days when you could still get used records at a good price i think i got this for like six bucks here in pittsburgh at a record store called jerry's and um oh jerry i love this yeah. record i mean it's tremendous i mean every song in this are coming home is great lady luck um getting tighter of course dealer i need love drifter um this time around oh did i mean how great are those and then you keep on moving like man i just saw glenn a couple weeks ago and uh, he played "Getting Tighter," which I was excited because it's you know one of my top two or three Deep Purple songs right. of all time. But I mean, he played "You Keep on Moving," and like it was literally like it was just chills inducing. Like just that that song, just the the emotion and mood and power of it. Like I just I just love this record. It covers so many bases. I mean, I guess in a lot of ways, it's kind of like shows you where. White Snake. With I was just gonna say it's pretty. It's more. It sounds more like early White Snake than Deep Purple in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a real. It's a real bluesy kind of kind of creature, but it's still it's still heavy. It just you know it, you're not gonna find like a Highway Star on here or like a Burn. Like none of that kind of yeah. like proto metal kind of stuff Coming is home here. The closest and it's not. Yeah, really. I mean it. It really strips like kind of like the the Blackmore metal vibe and like it just this is just heavy duty, heavy hard, funky soulful hard rock uh and uh you know i love the guitar playing on here and it's got it's such a shame that um things happen the way they they do in the world and uh that we lost bowling and that the, the band had fallen apart anyway but uh i would love to see what this lineup could have done had uh yeah. had they stayed together and had tommy live because out, I, yeah. the connection between that him and glenn had and um i just think that there's so much on offer here and this is actually um my second favorite Deep Purple record overall. Um, and uh, for years, people like bad mouth the shit out of this record. I think in recent years, it's had a, you know, like a, there's a renaissance of people that love this record. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, definitely, if you haven't heard it, and I would think most people watching the show had, but if you haven't, like, check this out because the the playing will blow your mind. And the, the vocals on here between David and Glenn are tremendous. Like, they, those two work so well together. And But, uh, you know, Tommy and and John like playing together and just going back and forth. The the whole this time around O to G bit is, you know, just tremendous. I, I can't think of a there's not a there's not a duffer on this record. It's a well, good it's a killer record. Relate, related to that, if anybody's if anybody likes this period of Deep Purple, I highly recommend the the uh, I've seen the Blu-ray of it called Phoenix Rising. Excellent, a great yeah. Yeah. great look at this lineup, the Mark IV lineup. Great recommendation, Tim. Yeah, that's a great movie. Um, man, yeah, that was real good. You should definitely, fans should definitely check that out. Very informative. I learned a lot from watching a lot of things I didn't know about that yeah. time. Because nobody you talks know, about that. You know, as a guitar player, when I first heard that, I thought, what makes this so different for me is how many songs Tommy's using a slide on. Because Richie did it a little bit like in Mistreated, but very, very seldom. Tommy's using a slide on at least half the album. And it sounds yeah. more like, you know, like Leonard Skinner than it does Deep Purple because of it's that. Very, I think. Yeah, I mean, Tommy had a very... Um, he's got a very Southern rock feel. And yeah, he like a, he's a more American style, obviously, to his playing than Yeah, Black yeah he was Moore the first does. American um, to join the band. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the guitar work on here and everything he did around this time period, I mean, the, the James Gang records that he did. Um, Billy Cobble. The, the, 
Uh, the Billy Cobb Metal oh, yeah, Mouse on records, cool. like those records, are like that guitar playing on those records Holy will blow mackerel. your mind to pieces. Like, yeah, he's not using the slide on Spectrum. <laughs> yeah, we lost so much when uh, I don't, I can't even imagine the amount of genius music we lost when Tommy died. He's a brilliant. It's, he was a brilliant player. Really, yeah, it's really a shame. Brilliant. Yeah, teaser and private eyes are great. Oh, tremendous records! It's a, it was a it was a great loss. It, oh my God, what a good guitar player! Oh well, life goes on. Yeah, well, Glenn Hughes yeah. put out a bunch of box sets. I think that have a lot of Tommy on it, or maybe. Well, I know there's some Tommy Bolin box sets out there. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. That have Glenn Hughes on it, but yeah, I mean, it, Glenn was just devastated. He just it blew his mind when he died. Yeah, to, Tommy's Tommy's brother has kept his. Uh, legacy alive there's a zillion tommy bolin cds you can get from mm -hmm. demos to live things the, the old energy um albums he recorded that never got officially released a bunch of like i said a bunch of live stuff um mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a couple of those uh deep purple king biscuit thing came out with tommy play which is much better yeah than that I last to... concert in japan because his playing on it's got, i mean david doesn't sound as good on it as he does on stuff but the the playing mm -hmm. tommy you know everyone knows the story about bolin because of his heroin habit him that arm like he just couldn't he you know fell asleep on it and he lost the the ability to like you know you know really fret up john, john lord pretty much carried that show yeah i mean tommy's week. just playing chords and it's a yeah. it's a rough watch but the that king biscuit show is uh tommy's you know playing that and uh, there was a release that came out that was just them like jamming kind of did they ever um, but should oh, they ever yeah. put that king biscuit show out on cd or anything it came out on cd okay. um and then there was one where they were jam just a jam yeah, rehearsal I think it's thing. Called days, days will come and days will go yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. that's that's very raw that's very cool I mean, I'll have yeah. To pick that up. yeah you know um, that band died uh, uh death for eight years they didn't come back until perfect strangers in 1984. rod yeah. evans says otherwise in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that's to me. You know what? I find that fascinating that that actually got as far as it did. But we're way off track. That's well, all right. We're having a good discussion. It's I think all good. The first Captain Beyond album is a masterpiece. I like all three. Uh, yeah. There you go. There all right, go. Butch. Cool. Let's get over to the Parish of Rock. Parish of Rock. What's your second? Okay. I thought we could get the three, but we're having such a good conversation. We're just going to do go our second. Parish will be the last one. So, uh, well, in which case, everybody... I'll I'll, I'll squeeze in squeeze in two. Okay, um, all right. The first one, the first one is a band that I don't think gets mentioned very often on the Contrarians, which is Fallout Boy. Um, and from my point of view, I mean, I love them. I th I think I think they're a pop rock band. Um, I also I also like the glam slash goth look that they have so and and i think live they're just fantastic they're just a really good live band and and probably the only band i i go and see now that i have i think live have elements of kiss when you look at the stage show they really? have all the pyrotechnics and they have all of that going on so very kiss like from a stage show point of view um wow and and they you know they've done they've done um eight albums studio albums um the first four were very emo um and then they went away and then they came back and they they then sort of changed their sound a bit um and they had two sort of more contemporary albums um they had elton john guest on one of the albums they had courtney love one of the albums they did a punk album although that's not what i'm going to talk about and when i say punk i mean hardcore old style punk i don't mean pop punk so you know something that that would sit in quite easily with the stranglers or the damned was one of their albums but the one i'm going to go with is their seventh album which is called mania um where they actually went edm now edm doesn't mean eagles of death metal as i thought it did when i first heard the term <laughs> it what it actually means is electronic dance music and and it's right. got a lot of um synth on it it's got a lot of um sort of drum drum sampling um not very much guitars and and the first single which was um young and menace I would say was their version of um, I was made for loving you. So just as I was made for loving you was a disco and dance song at the time in the seventies, very different to what kiss were doing. Then this was a dance techno track, mm -hmm. very different to what, what you'd have expected from them. Um, and the rest of the album was very similar. 
So it's it's a it's not really a rock album. Although when you see the songs live, they are they're still rock songs live. A bit like um, I'm from, I was made for loving you. It looks very you know sounds very different live than it does on record. So it's, mm-hmm. so I like the songs, but I prefer the live versions of the songs than the ones on the album. Um, and the reason I say it's an outlier is because it is very different than what well um, went before. Um, and they recently this year released a new album. And the new album very much goes back to their um, their earlier style. I think it's it's almost back to the first couple of albums, actually, very much back to that style. So this this particular one, Eight Mania, for me, is very different and stands out from, from everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I picked it partly because this program or this channel is called The Contrarians. So I thought I'd pick something a bit contrarian, something maybe, maybe a bit different. Um, and the other one, my third one, which is also maybe a little bit different, was, was or is Mother's Finest. Oh, my God. I Oh, yeah, go ahead. I yeah, so yeah. so Mother's Finest, um, nor, you, I would normally think of them as a f- sort of a funk rock band, mm-hmm. kind of a cross between Aerosmith and Prince, I guess, um, with, with two vocalists, a female vocalist and a male vocalist that alternate. But this album that came out in 81 called Iron Age is actually a heavy metal album. It I could heard. it could actually be wow. a new wave of British heavy metal album. Oh, the only difference being it sounds like the, the singer, the female singer at least, sounds like Tina Turner. So if you can imagine heavy metal with Tina Turner singing, wow, that's what you get with the Mother's Finest album. So I love Mother's Finest, but that was the first one I ever heard. Um so that kind of set the thinking. The other albums are still very guitar orientated, still very heavy guitar, but you've got a lot more funk in there as well, sort of the funky bass line. You don't have any funk in that album. That album is purely heavy metal. Um, and then afterwards, when they came back, um, or the next album after that, rather, kind of returned back to that funk, that kind of funk sound. And there's songs on here such as... Um, Evolution, rock and roll tonight. Spelt the T. Uh, sorry, spelt two with with the with the number. Um, it sounds sounds like it could have come from a Judas Priest album, I think. And um, so the album the album's fantastic. And and but it is very different to everything else because it is raw. It's a raw metal album as opposed to a funk rock album. Wow, that's crazy. I had that, and I got I got I had to get rid of it to uh, survive, but I never got it back. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you and, think and, about it, well, I don't know way, the way Mother's Finest was viewed in the UK, but over here, you know, they kind of had their moment and, you know, I, I the, the, like Fallout Boy, I don't know how they were were viewed over there in the UK. Here, I don't think they get any traction any all uh, anymore. They were big for a while. Well, the last the last four albums have all been number one in the States. Oh, Bill tells, you, tells you what I'm keeping track of. Or, or, or platinum albums or multi platinum okay. albums. So so they I mean I'm sorry, I'm talking about Fallout Boy for a minute, not not um No, no, Mother's I get Finest. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mother's Finest over here, not so much in the UK, uh, but a huge in Germany. And and in fact, I, I, funny enough, when I was doing a bit of research for this um this morning, they've just announced a tour of, of Germany and the main the main members are the same. So there's four of them: the bassist, the guitarist, and the two singers are the same as set up the band back in 1970. Yeah, so the core of Moses? the band, yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Mo, or Moses Mo is the guitarist; yeah. he's still in there. Uh, Wizard Sage, the bass player, he's still there. Doc Murdoch, the vocalist, and Baby Jean Kennedy, the other vocalist, they're all still in the band. So you know they've wow, been around a long time. Cool. Um, 14 albums, the last one about five years ago, maybe a bit longer. So, so they're no still, idea. you know, there's still a band, they're still there. Um, but, but yeah, most people don't know them and probably don't know them at all, but, but certainly yeah. don't know them anymore. Well, yeah. that cover just screams metal. That's why I bought Oh, it, it is. Yeah. And, and well, I don't know what you thought of it, Ram, but it, but to me, it I is a heavy it. metal album. I liked it. I sacrificed it so I could get food. <laughs> that was fair. <laughs> Rand. There you, I like that rant, but you know. Parrish, did you hear the um? Did you hear the two records that uh, Moses and BB Queen did? In uh, it was like around the, the mid '80s. They were a band called Illusion. They did two albums, uh, self titled, and then an album called I Like It Loud. Um, just straight up like AOR, kind of like hard rock records. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they were doing quite a bit of other stuff at the time because I know I know they 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 um couple of them played with Ricky Metlock on a version of Blackfoot. 
Um, I also played with um, um, Fleetwood Mac on, on, you know, sort of toured as a backing backing band for them at one right. point. So, so certainly during the eighties, they were doing a lot of a lot of stuff for other people. Yeah, those Illusion records are worth checking out if you're into that kind of that kind of music. Okay, I, don't, I don't know yeah. if you ever heard them. Uh, I feel like they they might be up your alley too. I've heard of them. In fact, in fact, one of the tracks on this album is called Illusion, so that's probably where they got the name from. Maybe. <laughs> cool. Excellent parish. Damn, always bringing it. Well, he is the parish of rock. Anyway, does anybody have like an honorable mention before we wrap it up? Because hey, I know we were going to prep three, three, but well, we're over an hour. I'm trying to go ahead. Thing. Go real quick. Go real Low quick. Low hanging fruit, but this was this was mine. Then Lizzie, yeah. Is yeah. this is yeah. this hanging fruit, guys? I don't think I that's an. I don't think Relayer's an outlier. No. Rand, I'm going to veto outlier, that. But... I'm going to veto that one. It's out. It's an outlier because Sound Chaser was never done. Any nobody ever did anything before or after Sound Chaser that sounds like Sound Chaser. For one thing, it's a it's a very outlier song. The Gates sounds of Delirium, like, yes. is absolutely nuts. Nobody ever wrote a song like that. And the keyboard player only did the one album and, and was gone. I mean, I think it's pretty outlier for yes. It always yeah, but what me. about drama? Is that an outlier? Not really. I just think Why? they were trying to be heavy in, in 1980, and it failed, and they decided to go into, uh, you know, two of those guys created Asia. And Asia, we thought Asia was going to be a prog band on a prog album. And when we played it, we were like, what the hell did these I guys do? I don't know. Do? I think that Asia was pretty That's cool. one of the greatest well, great. records ever made. Yeah, yeah Rand, don't dog Love Asia. Fantastic record. <laughs> Cutting it fine. To come out Jesus. With a prog album. Time and time again. Oh, oh it's guys, classic. I love, hey, don't get me wrong. I love Asia. I got okay. a box set over there of the of the Greg Lake concert. It cost me $100. I got it from Ken Golden at Laser's Edge. But what I'm saying is... <laughs> We were expecting, and you should never do this, folks. Kids, don't ever expect your band to <laughs> do something that, that you want before that you hear it, because you'll be disappointed. <laughs> Expectation leads to disappointment. Rand is 100% right on that, yep, kids. That's true. <laughs> if you expect nothing, you'll, you'll expect be okay. Nothing and you, oh, you here it comes no, with the plug. Oh. No disappointment. Oh, this is my <laughs> album, guys. <laughs> it's, it's Rand Anthony Kelly, No Easy Access. It can be bought at Bandcamp, Rand, randanthonykelly.bandcamp.com. And uh, I'm real proud of this. Thank you, Ryan Gavalier, Gavalier Productions. Now, is that an outlier to your catalog? I don't have a catalog. That's my <laughs> that, Andrew, that is the outlier. That is ah. the outlier. All but right, so Tim, to. thank you, Rand, for your plug. Tim Derling, so you've got Thin Lizzy. Oh, yeah, it's been talked album. Okay, it's been talked about a lot. I like this album, but I mean, mm -hmm. it's their, it's their, you know, their metal album, and it doesn't really sound like anything that came before. Well, you know, Steve like Tranquility the Deep did a ranking of their albums last uh, weekend, and it was it's amazing. Well, where did you know, it, where did it... Not, uh, one more Thin Lizzy album might have sounded like with that lineup, right? Well, it's John like Sykes Perfect. kills on that album. He's just yeah. a monster. Yeah. He turned he turned Thin Lizzy into a metal band. Yeah. And everybody thought Gary Moore was going to do that when they did Black Rose, but that's not what happened. Gary Moore blended in better with Scott Gorham. This yeah. album, John Sykes blows Scott Gorham out of the water. <laughs> you can see Blue Murders coming after this. It's only yeah. uh, I how mean, many years? Six even, years later. I mean, even you know, look at the, I mean, even the album cover that doesn't look yeah. like a Tim Lizzie album. That yeah, looks like a bass guitar going into album. the ground. It does. You're right. Metal fist yeah. coming out of the. They were so that's my, that's my third one. All right, cool. Andrew, you got a third one? Uh, well, I told you Chinese democracy, but oh, I got okay. a couple honorable mentions here. Oh, go ahead. You're good. I've got never heard that. Armored Saint. Okay. Symbol of Salvation, written mostly by Dave Pritchard, who died before he got a chance to actually record it. So they, uh, so they recorded with two other guys. I think it's a real outlier. It's my favorite record by them. Fantastic. Gamma oh, 3. Yes. That's a good one. Yeah, keyboards all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mitchell awesome. Froome, Mitchell yeah, Froome, so good. Yeah, and I love Mitchell Froome as a producer. I think the guy's brilliant. What a great producer! And then, except their ACDC record, <laughs> so weird. Man, so German weird. band trying to sound like Man, a man. <laughs> yeah. And then also their hair metal record, yeah, Eat the Heat. Yeah. yeah. A couple Definitely of outliers on there. Yeah. Right. And then 
my th- I'm such a big Thin Lizzy fan, and I totally agree with Tim that Thunder and Lightning is an outlier, but I think Renegade is too as well. That's Martin's because favorite Thin Lizzy album. It's so good. Well, what makes you say it's an outlier? Go ahead, real quick. The, the addition of the keyboards. Mm. Okay. It's, oh, it's yeah. right up front. It's it's just in your face, whereas they had been just a straight up guitar band up until then. And all of a sudden they're 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 adding keyboards. They're they're like Thin Lizzy meets Deep Purple. It's it's just a total outlier. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite records by them, depending on the day. But great yeah, record. I love that. Right. I got one more grant. Oh my god. All right, yeah. Yeah, Rand, go ahead. <laughs> Gentle giant. I'm trying to get over to Butch, but hold on, Butch. Sorry. Go ahead, Rand. Oh, Gentle Giant, Giant for a Day. So Well, that different. album just sucks. Yeah, but it's different <laughs> in their catalog. It's an outlier. That's a diff- oh, yeah, it's an outlier. The only one I didn't buy on CD. <laughs> well, I've heard yeah, worse, good... but it's not great. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you, Rand. But real, real quick, got here's my one? honorable right. mention. This was my third one. This is a candle mass from the 13th Sun. Um, where it differs from the other candle mass records is that this, as opposed to, I mean, Messiah Markland's not singing on this. Um, he'd left the band. They did an album called Chapter Six with, uh, I think Matt Levin was on vocals on that. Uh, pro- actually, I might be wrong on that. I'm spacing it to someone old right in and tell me how stupid i am but uh um anyway oh. even that one was closer to what they had done before but uh, this is like straight up like i mean not that there's no sabbath in candle mass's catalog but this is mm-hmm. straight up like volume four kind of like worship it's lay failing with like a you know it's a four piece uh, you know three piece m- musical band just uh lay failing on bass and then matt Stahl on guitar and uh a guy named jojo perkovic on drums with a uh, Bjorn Flodquist on vocals who sang on uh, the album before this deck tell glomerata but this doesn't have like really like that that operatic epic kind of like vibe that the other that nightfall or epicus dumicus metallicus had this is just straight up like pounding sabbathy with like some uh stellar kind of like uh and by stellar I mean like spacey kind of vibe um um I just love this this record like actually this is probably like this might be my favorite candle mass record. Um, I love nightfall, but I would probably just between us pick this one. If I had to take <laughs> just between us, just between, if I had to just, go to a desert Island, just whispered in my ear. Cause it's hot alone. Um, this album. So that's my quick, that was my third one. All right, what, I what, had what label is that on? Was that, this is on that... Peaceville. Um, okay. What year is that? I too? Think 99. 99. And the reason okay. I think it came out as a, candle mass record is because the label said if you want to put that out it's kind of like what happened with iomi with seven star i mean mm-hmm. i'm pretty sure the label said if you want to put this music out it has to come out as candle mass so like put it out as candle mass um a lot of people say this is candle mass in name only um but i still think it's oh you think it was going to be a solo album should have been yeah i think it was either well, it's like be that like miles goodwin or... album tim oh yeah yeah jethro told a kind of thing Jethro Tull. Yeah, forever for now. There's a, a show. One. There's a show right there. Albums that are only albums. Yeah. You know, in name, only, for in name <laughs> only. So there, there's a show. Marco, I write bought, that down. Where is Marco? When I found out Eddie Jobson was on that, I bought it in a heartbeat. I could care less what it sounds like. <laughs> All right, boys. I think let's wrap. It's a good record. It's great. Oh, it's I love good. it. All right, boys. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, did we go on a tangent a little bit? Yeah, but we're yeah, talking music for... here, and it, the whole point of the Contrarians. Well. The whole point on this show is to turn you on to something. Check out some of these outlier albums. These guys on this panel know their stuff. And just check it out. So I want to thank the the Parish of Rock, Rand Kelly, Tim Durling, Andrew Clark, and Butch. What a great discussion. It was fun hanging out. We went like almost an hour and a half. Yeah, (laughs) outlier doesn't mean bad. No, No. just different. Just different. But check these records out. These guys are on top of it. But uh, we do have a Patreon if you'd like to join us. Patreon account. We do have a Kofi account. Buy us a, a, a cup of coffee or a pint. We'd love that. We also like donos. Feel free to just give us money because we like money. We do this out of the kindness of our hearts and because we're music addicts. And we just can't get enough. Support the channel. We'd love to have you. So, all right, gentlemen. Nice to see you. 
I don't, I can't tell you what's next and I don't know when I'll see you all next, but good night, everybody. Thanks for coming on here and we will see you on the next one. <laughs>